Hello. All right. Hello, Barcelona. How's everybody doing right now? Yeah. This is, the, this is the part of the day that you've been waiting for. We're here for startups. And today, we have our first startup awards at four years from now. Can I ask all you guys in the back to move front, uh, forward a little bit so we can get a, you know, a little bit more engagement for this part of the session? We want you to support the startups. So guys in the back, come on up. Don't be shy. There's plenty of space in the front. OK, so um, this is, we have 90 minutes together. Uh, what we're going to do today is we have the first 30 minutes where we will introduce uh, the judges and give a little bit of the background about uh, what they're doing, what, how they're doing are, are relevant to the startup ecosystem, and how uh, the different innovation thesis can help the startup to grow. Um, the second part, we have a 60-minute startup pitch session. Uh, we're also going to have audience voting. Uh, we have eight great startups from all over the world joining us today. And uh, uh, you, will, you will meet them very, very shortly. So real quick, before we start, how many, guys, how many of you guys have been to a startup competition before? Quick raise of hands. All right, keep those hands up. How many of you guys have pitched in the startup competition? Not bad. And then how many of you guys have been in a, a judge as an investor or as a, as a corporate? Wow, OK. So you guys all know how this works. This is pretty straightforward. Um, what we'll do is uh, about this year, this is four years from now award. Uh, we're doing it a little bit differently. It's actually uh, th uh, three partners that have came together to make this event happen. Uh, big thanks and shout out to F Success. F Success is the world's largest startup community. Uh, they have about 58,000 startups on the platform and over four and half a million uh, angel startups and founders on there. So they were a great platform for us to recruit and also onboard uh, companies for this competition. Also, a big shout out to Barcelona and the Mobile World Capital. Obviously, we're well, having a good time here, and uh, they're gracious to, to host us at this event. So big, big round of applause for Mobile World Capital. Thank you. <laughs> and lastly, my name is Mike Chen. I'll be your host today. I'm from Swell. Swell is one, it's a, a strategic corporate venture firm. Uh, we've launched about 40 corporate innovation projects uh, around the world in the last 18 months. And uh, our focus is on uh, launching corporate innovation initiatives around different technology hubs. And today, we have brought a big coalition of our partners um, and friends that are here to essentially help drive the growth stage of the startup that are pitching today. So today, we have eight finalists. Um, but this is going to be the first edition of the three competitions that's going to take place in the next two days. Uh, today, we focus on uh, traditional industry, companies that are being disrupted by mobile. And, uh, and tomorrow, we have Internet of Things. And Wednesday, we have digital media. A little quick background about this year's competition. We, uh, we have 516 startups that applied to the competition. That's a, gr that's a good number. Uh, this uh, started from all over 56 countries and 208 cities. Um, the, the methodology we use was we we had companies that apply to the competition, and we also went out to recruit companies that we believe were relevant to the specific industry thesis um, that, that are presented in the three tracks. So um, yeah, so for, first, uh, a lot of companies from, from Spain, a lot of companies from the US, and then UK, Germany, Italy. Uh, if, you see your if you see your country here, raise your hand real quick. <laughs> All right, not bad, maybe a third. OK, so next, um, for uh, the three tracks, this is actually the most uh, happening track. More than half the companies were actually applied for traditional, traditional industries. And um, from other industries, we have uh, IT, telco, as communication. In terms of funding stages, about half the company are in the C stage. So we're definitely at the very early part of the startup growth. As we know, in Europe, uh, primarily, there's a lot of early stage funding. And we think that by doing it this way, we will have um, you know, a, a, a way to address you know, the next, what happens next in terms of how do we get from seed uh, to A, et cetera. So a lot of companies are fundraising. And uh, make sure you hang out and check them out at the booth afterwards. 
so that's about our fundraising. And then lastly, uh, in terms of revenue, so about half the companies here are, are not making any money yet. But uh, surprisingly, actually more than half the company already have some sort of revenue. Um, about 20% of them have uh, between 10K to 100K, which is actually, we think, a really good metric in terms of uh, traction. And without further ado, I would like to introduce all the judges, invite them to come on stage, and um, they're going to be over there, and you guys can come probably from the side. And uh, give, give, let's give a warm welcome for all the judges for today's competition. All right, so you guys have to share mics, um, and, <laughs> and I guess what we'll do is um, we're going to have a few questions for the judge, uh, the judges, and what we're going to do is, uh, you know, we, I guess we can start. Uh, who wants to go first? Francis, would you like to go first? Amit? Okay, so we, we have a few questions for the judges. Really, you know, the question is, hey, um, why are you here? Um, what, what do you do in your company, and how are you a great startup partner? And uh, that's, that's sort of you know, the hard question. So Francis, I'll, I'll have you take a first crack. Great. Um, thank you, Mike. Um, OK, I, I'm uh, the uh, director of innovation in um, uh, Bank Sabadell. Um, uh, I can tell you that I'm, I just uh, joined the bank uh, three weeks ago. So uh, <laughs> I'm not that familiar. But um, Bank Sabadell is uh, very well uh, you know, uh, situated in, uh, in terms of collaboration with startups here in, in, in Spain. Um, has a very strong commitment with the um, uh, startup ecosystem through a program called Be a Startup. And um, uh, the bank has more than 70 um, uh, branches here in Spain uh, devoted and focused on giving service to uh, startups, for example. Um, we have also a um, uh, program, a uh, 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 venture capital program for startups. It's a uh, uh, small uh, fund of 1 million euros a year, but um, it's enough for seed capital here technological, for technological companies. And we have also uh, collaborative uh, innovation programs in place. So uh, we, we are trying to empower all these uh, you know, internal efforts with all the collaboration with uh, the startup ecosystem here in Spain, and hopefully um, yeah, later uh, in, in other countries. So. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Francis. And so next, thank we you. have another bank, BBVA. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of the stuff you're doing and how you guys are a great startup partner? Yeah, Tepo Paola from BBVA. I was going to use the same excuse, <laughs> but, but uh, as I've only been at four months, but now I feel like a veteran. So. Um, maybe one uh, way to explain how we work with, with startups is, is actually my team um, and, and the kind of how we're, we're structured. So we have uh, one team that's called Open Innovation, um, which, we're, which organizes developer events um, and, and takes our open platform to market. The open platform is, is basically out there for any startup who wants to to build a new business in the, in the space of, of financial services. Um, we have our M&A team. You all know what that is. That's the exit for the VCs in the room. Um, we have internal ventures, which more and more actually does no longer mean that we build the stuff ourselves, but actually together with startups and larger companies. Um, we have our venture capital team, which is um, so far has been based uh, out of San Francisco, is now also coming to Europe. Um, and I guess I missed one. Did I mention uh, our business development team, which, which does partnerships? So those are the different ways that we work with startups. We, and actually on the open innovation, maybe I should mention one more thing, which is that we have open innovation centers uh, where there's a lot of activity, for example, in our Madrid um, center, we had more than 200 events last year, 
uh, all around uh, startups, entrepreneurship, new business. Great, Katrin. Well, I guess that's uh, true for all of us. We're all quite new in, in our position. I'm Katrin from the Lufthansa Innovation Hub, a newly founded subsidiary of the Lufthansa Group. I hope you all know some of our brands like Lufthansa Passenger Airlines or Swiss or Austrian. So maybe even you came here with one of our airlines. Um, and what we do actually in the Lufthansa Innovation Hub, we realize we need to come closer to innovation. We need to be more focused on agile and speed when it comes to the travel industry. And this is what we do within the Innovation Hub. But we've decided to not be the typical accelerator or incubator in, in the way we actually approach startups. But what we offer is um, our, the assets of the Lufthansa Group coming from over 100 million passengers to of almost 300 million meals which we serve to people in aircrafts around the globe. Um, to bring that as an asset to a co-creation deal with different startups um, along the travel chain. So that's uh, the way we do innovation or cooperation with startups. Thank you. Well, the judges are really good on time. They're, I told them it's 60-second pitches, and every, so far it's been right on. And uh, thank you, Katrin. And Vincent from Absolute, and what has Absolute been doing? Um, so I'm Vincent. I'm driving a part of the digital team uh, in a new entity, as anyone else uh, here on the panel. Uh, we've just created a, uh, a new entity called Growth uh, within the Absolute company, we, which is just focusing on innovation. Uh, of course, product innovation, as you may have guessed, but as well, new businesses. I mean, if tomorrow uh, Absolute would have hotels, I mean, that's part of what we do. And digital plays an important role in there. What we bring to the table, I think, to the startup are two things. One is a brand. I think Absolute, would, hopefully, uh, all of you uh, would, uh, would know the brand. Hopefully, you would have tasted it. Uh, so I think that's, that's something which is a great asset that we are happily sharing and, and helping startups to, to leverage. But we have also a, a huge sales force uh, on the ground. Uh, that can help as well uh, scaling up any, uh, any innovation. What are we looking for? Actually, uh, we believe that we're moving from just selling vodka in a bottle, even though uh, one of the best vodka in the world, to drinks, because that's the way people consume uh, our product, to even experiences, because all what matters for us is just enjoying great moments of conviviality or social, uh, social gatherings. Uh, so that's what we're looking for uh, today uh, in Barcelona. Okay, thank you, Vincent. And next to Vincent, we have Gabby from Coca-Cola, which is another beverage company. So what's Coke doing here? Did you put the banks and the drinks together on purpose? Is that I ice is coming at in, in 60 minutes. We have happy hour. I know you guys are all waiting for that. It's coming up soon. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Gabby, and I uh, run in Tel Aviv a program called The Bridge by Coca-Cola. And it's the first one of Coca-Cola any, everywhere, anywhere in the world. And uh, similar to, to my colleagues here, we started about eight months ago, and the idea was um, to, to do two things. One thing is uh, we, we met a lot of startups and a lot of angel investors and, and venture capitalists, and what we heard from them is that um, startups have great technologies in many cases, but sometimes they don't know how to tell their story in a way that uh, works for, for the corporates to understand it. And uh, that's something that Coca-Cola knows a little bit about uh, how to tell a story. And um, we, we, took, we took that, that capability on one side and gave, uh, we took 10 startups out of uh, above 100 we found. And uh, with these startups, we gave them a training program. Uh, we opened up Coca-Cola's internal training programs to let them understand how it is, how do brands think about marketing, how does Coca-Cola think about it, and how, do, uh, how can they benefit it for when they tell their story. And on the other side, we opened up uh, Coca-Cola as a first business partner. So basically finding uh, com companies are ready to scale that have a very innovative technology, and we help them when, when they reach a scale, scale uh, stage, we help them grow to work with corporations like Coca-Cola. So we have a lot of old brands on the, on the panel today, but last but not least, we have Emmett from Bessemer Venture. They're one of the oldest VC firms with north of over 100 IPOs, I think, right? Yeah, that's true, more than 105 IPOs and still counting. Pardon me, 105. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Unlike uh, some of the banks or uh, beverage companies here, we're a more traditional VC. Uh, we have a $1.6 billion fund. We just uh, closed a new fund uh, this week. We just announced it, another $1.6 billion fund. Uh, we're a global uh, VC firm with offices in New York, in the Valley, in Boston, in Israel, and in India. And it's one global partnership across all of these. So we're kind of unique in that uh, nature. We're a pretty large VC, but we have a very early stage DNA. 
So we like to invest early. Sometimes uh, we do some seed rounds, but mainly Series A and above. So anything from two, three million dollars up to 40, 50 million dollars. And some of our companies, our best companies, we kind of kept investing through the, their lifetime. Uh, for example, Twilio, which is an API for communication, we led their seed round originally with $200,000. And now we have more than $60 million invested in the company, kind of leading many rounds uh, throughout. Uh, that's Bessemer. Nice. So a quick show of hands, judges. If you guys are writing checks for startups in terms of investment, let's do a quick show of hands so you guys know who to talk to after. OK. All right. <laughs> Um, so next question, I think we'll, we're going to shift gears. Um, this is going to be a combined question just because of time. Uh, let's talk about the future and about either the investment thesis or innovation thesis. And you can you know, answer it based on uh, something you've done with the startup so far. We can talk more aspirationally about things that, are, that you're looking for that you, that's coming down the, down the line. And maybe we'll, we'll, we'll start reverse. Maybe Amit will start with you. OK. So as a large VC fund, we invest almost in any area out there. But the way we like to think about investments is what we call roadmaps, which are kind of uh, our own thesis of what's interesting. And we were very, very proactive. Once we define these roadmaps, we reach out to companies, try to find the best entrepreneurs and best companies, regardless whether they came to us or we came to them, and invest them uh, in them. And a few of the roadmaps that we're exploring today are IoT. And within IoT, we have our own thesis of what works, what doesn't work. Uh, there's been a lot of hype and a lot of uh, talk about IoT, but we think it's going to be a really big uh, wave, and there's going to be a few really big companies that are going to come up of this uh, IoT wave. Uh, the other kind of areas that we like are vertical marketplaces. Uh, this is basically taking kind of the Craigslist and building out of each one of them a vertical marketplace. Uh, we have a few of these in many verticals, and we see when they work well, it's just an incredible business. Uh, the other one is what we call the uh, Cloud 2.0, which is basically allowing enterprises or SMEs to leverage cloud in ways that they haven't done so far. So each one of the investment teams have their own roadmaps. We try to identify the best companies uh, that fit these. Um, so I'm, uh, first of all, we're looking at Coca-Cola because its size has a lot of uh, interest in a lot of different areas. So it uh, could be in supply chain and consumer engagement, uh, marketing, innovation, and maybe, uh, we, can we give an example of one of the startups we're working with? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Okay, so there's actually a startup that has a booth outside here, a startup called Dovey. I recommend you should go uh, take a look at them. And um, well, they're one of the 10 startups we work with in the last six months. And uh, what, what they do is something very interesting. They do, they have a data transmission uh, over ultrasonic sound. So sound that uh, human ears can't hear, but they can transmit data, encrypted data. And you're asking, how can Coca-Cola be related to that? So uh, speaking about IoT, speaking about vending machines, we are connecting to Coca-Cola's uh, 15 million vending machines around the world and be able to interact with them in a smart way, in a different way that uh, you've been interacting before. Think about stadiums where you can transmit sound and data over speakers and have the talk to, uh, to talk to the consumers' uh, phones. And kind of uh, taking a different approach at uh, what you think that traditionally Coca-Cola would be looking at. And that's, I think, one of the examples that uh, kind of shows the, the width of what we're looking at and the type of different uh, things we're looking at. You can see at the bridge by Coca-Cola.com, you can see the list of all the 10 companies to get a kind of a feeling of, of the, the very, very wide area of uh, things we're looking at. We also have a, a pet sensor company in our, one of the 10 companies we're looking at. I'll, I'll leave your imagination to guess how that connects to Coca-Cola. All right, and then Vincent, what is the future of vodka? I think the future of vodka is, 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 not, is not the bottle as such. I think it's, as I said, it's experiences. It's the way, I mean, the way uh, what is surrounding uh, that, that very, I mean, very uh, nice moment where, that you share with friends or families. Uh, so we do believe that, that uh, moving more towards services and experiences rather than just the physical bottle is something that, that, that's going to change the industry. Uh, we just concluded a, a, a pilot in uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles. We partner up with a startup that is doing home delivery. But instead of doing just traditional home delivery, which is uh, getting your bottle delivered to your place within 60 minutes, we say, let's bring it to the next level. Let's add what is needed to mix good cocktails. Uh, and why not even adding a bartender? So we ended up selling packages to consumers where within 45 minutes, they can get a bartender coming to the place with fresh ingredients and spirits, vodka, just to have a, a nice moment and, and, and beautiful drinks. 
And the feedback we got from consumers was just amazing. People couldn't believe that they could get such a great drinks at home. So we believe that it's going to change the way people are, are, are buying spirits. Uh, and they're going to try to get experiences and, and a package rather than just a bottle of vodka. Thank you, Vincent. Well, when it comes to an outlook for the, for the aviation industry, we believe that we have to change perspective to some degree because at the moment we believe, well, you're a, the Lufthansa customer or maybe you're a customer of one uh, other airline, but we think you have to change perspective in regards to all people who travel are human beings and they want to have a good experience. And once we take on that perspective, um, we have to actually rethink some a aspects of our business model and change the way we treat our customers. So that's, that's the very broad view on, on how we perceive from inspiring people to travel and where to travel to and then um, ending that travel experience with sharing whatever experience you had. So this is the broad field we are looking at. Um, when it comes to the future, the perspective is the most important change we, we're going into. And when it comes to innovation, we do as little things such as providing um, Wi-Fi to you when you travel through a small device, a 3G-made Skyrom product, for example, that you just take along and you can connect with five devices um, that you personally have, and it's secure and it's safe, and you can have the same data consumption as you have at home, and it doesn't cost you um, a hell of a fortune. So from these little things that actually benefit you as a customer to broader uh, corporations um, with bigger companies already that cannot be really called startups anymore, like Airbnb, but who really disrupt disrupted the um, travel segment to some degree, this is the activity we're actually um, doing. That's awesome. All right. so. Before, Trevor, before you start, I think because we have two banks on stage, I think it would be really interesting to see you know, how right, uh, two different approaches in terms of a more global approach versus a more Spain approach in terms of how you guys are looking at the innovation uh, uh, for the banking industry. I'm actually a senator uh, only, I guess, if you, got, if, you got, uh, if you got the Wi-Fi on all of the flights, maybe I would get all the way to the top level. Uh, so. Um, so what, what, do we, uh, what do we invest in? Um, I guess you could say that financial services and adjacent areas. Um, and maybe, maybe kind of you would have to answer the question first that, well, what is the future of banking? If somebody here knows, you know, could you please come after the session and tell me as well? I can, all, I can, all I can tell you is that it's going to be rather different. Um, most of the innovation in financial services is actually happening outside banks today. And, um, and we invest in very many different ways into that kind of disruption, which is actually uh, competing with our core business. Um, then maybe another way of looking at what is the future of banking is that maybe a bank in the future is no longer just a bank. Um, so, so the you could talk about what can you do with data, et cetera, but I think if you take it from another angle, which is what are the customer needs? Do you, does everybody in here uh, think about when you're thinking about your housing, are, is the, is, are you always so focused on your mortgage or is housing a something, a much bigger topic for you and maybe somebody could actually offer you uh, a, a, f a fuller service around housing, which part of which has to do with insurance and banking but then there are lots of other things. And, uh, and so the, the whole, um, whole kind of evolution around customer needs is going to drive where, on the, where our industry goes as well, even as it is a very regulated industry. All right, that helps. Uh, my, my, our approach is not that different from yours, absolutely. Uh, nobody knows uh, uh, what the future of banking is going to be. Uh, but uh, what we already know that is going to be very, very different. And we, we pretty know uh, very well that we have to evolve from a, you know, from a company to a platform you know, that allows uh, companies and allows other uh, third parties uh, to develop their business and their collaboration. So uh, uh, the areas that we are focused uh, right now are pretty similar to the ones that VBBJ was saying is uh, consumer experience, obviously mobile, why not, uh, big data and um, all the da data analytics, cyber security, privacy, all the adjacent businesses that we think that could be um, strategic for us in the future. 
All right, thank you, judges. So we're going to get set up for our first pitch. Um, we have maybe 30 seconds while we get everything ready. So in the meanwhile, why don't you guys introduce yourself to the person to your right while we do that? And we'll be right back. <laughs> OK. Yeah, so you have. All right, so we have our first company. Doesn't Are you guys work. ready? Are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready in the back? <laughs> Are you <re> OK, <laughs> so first company, we have an echo from Cavallo. Uh, it's a Spanish company. Uh, he's been here for, for a few years. Uh, and uh, we'll, without further ado, we'll have you yeah. okay. talk about I don't Cavallo. know if this works. Yeah, this works. OK. so. All right, uh, I'm going to do this pretty quick. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to introduce you Caravello. So what's Caravello? Uh, very simple. We do post-sale solutions for travel companies, OK? So what do we mean by travel? Travel means like uh, hotels, means trains, means things like that, but mainly aviation. We are, for the time being, very much focused on airlines. We will, in the future, develop new industries. And this is what we do in post-sale. Post-sale is that moment in time in between the moment you buy your ticket, your plane ticket, and you use your plane ticket. In that time frame, there's a lot of things we can do, and we help airlines basically to do two things, either increase revenues or reduce costs. Okay, these are some of the companies we are working with, for the time being pretty much airlines, also entering into trains. And this is how we divide the post-sale area. I don't have time to explain you all the things we do, but I will just take one example uh, in the upsells. Upsells basically means we help airlines, in this case, sell whatever they can't sell. So there are some things that sometimes they just don't sell, and we create a win-win situation for both airlines and passengers to benefit together. So for instance, if I take this passenger, he wants to do something very simple, fly business cheap, okay? And I have this airline, which you know, can't afford having empty business class tickets. So around that, we build a product, an upgrade, and this is what it does. If the video plays, I will tell you everything about that. OK, so in here you see you know, um, the plane ticket I just bought. I'm flying with Scoot, an airline. Sometime after my booking is made, I get this offer, which is very interesting. Ooh. It looks like I can bid for an upgrade. Oh, that's very interesting. I want to know more about that. And then I go into this nice website, very simple process. Choose the flight you want to be upgraded, indicate how much you want to pay, and you will be notified. Of course, the magic is here when you have to set your own price. So no, no big drama. The more you want to pay, the more likely it is you will actually get the upgrade. 
whenever you make your mind, you just click continue and you give us your details. Contact and payment details, so you don't pay, but you indicate which is the credit card we should charge. You accept terms and conditions and you are good to go. So you just have to wait until sort of like last minute to see if we actually can offer you this uh, upgrade. In this case, you are lucky, so you got it and you've been upgraded. We communicate you that. We send you the new travel details, the new boarding pass, everything is automated. And all this happened within the brand of the airline. Of course, little thing powered by Caravello. That's it, I think. All right. All right, so Ineco, what are you looking for right now? Are you looking for money? Are you looking for partners? Looking for money and partners. Maybe we are looking for a conversation with Lufthansa here. Uh, let's see about that. Uh, so, I mean, uh, we are sort of like young company, but moving uh, forward pretty fast. So, yes, we are fundraising, and yes, uh, to consolidate ourselves in the airline industry, but also to enter into new grounds like hotels and trains. Awesome. Catherine from Lufthansa, do you have some feedback, some comment, questions? Well, we're already uh, on the slides because German Wings and Euro Wings, of course, is part of the Lufthansa Group as well. Uh, but I'm sure we will continue the conversation for, for the other airlines that we have in our portfolio. And I think it's, uh, it's mutually beneficial, uh, the product that you're offering for the consumer, as you have probably a better, better flight experience. And for Lufthansa, as we don't have um, an empty seat. So that's mm -hmm. great. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the idea. It's like... Uh, we come here uh, like to sort of like make win-win situations. We believe both airlines and you know consumers can benefit and you know create new services that benefit both. So that's the idea. Perfect. Other comment question from judges? Maybe uh, how about Tepo or Francis? Uh, you know, do you see travel as an area that uh, that banks are potentially getting involved with? Who said banks in this model? <laughs> And I, I was actually just asking, can, what's, the, what's the primary reason for, for example, Lufthansa to use you instead of building it oh. themselves? Well, several reasons. I mean, first of all, I guess it's not their, their focus. Their focus is to sell tickets, which is a very difficult business, by the way, and they do an, an awesome job. Uh, we take over after the sale is made. Uh, we are experts in this very small field, and whatever we learn from other airlines, we can also apply to them. So it does make sense for us because we serve the entire market, and they can benefit from this experience, I would say. By the way, Mike, there are quite a few companies in the banking business that are doing the same. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, any, anybody else? Okay, I'm in. Could you, could you share any it. results you have so far? Uh, what, the, what are the numbers showing? Oh, you mean like KPIs and stuff? Yeah. Um, it might be a bit sensitive, uh, so I won't disclose like many like revenue figures, but I mean, we can say that, for instance, in terms of upgrades, we can look at between one or two upgrades per flight. So it may seem like not huge, but it is indeed very interesting. Because I mean, at the end of the day, basically you maintain operations as they are for the airline. So they will travel the same passengers, the, fl the flight is going to be just on schedule, everything goes the same, but you make more revenue, so it's no cost involved. How are the airlines thinking about kind of cannibalizing their own uh, sales by mm -hmm. you know, having people kind of use this, wait for the discount later on instead of buying now business class? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, we have several services. Some uh, suffer from this like risk of cannibalization, if I may. Some others don't. But for instance, the upgrade does. You know, it's like okay, if I'm a smart traveler, uh, I mean, I will just you know ask for the upgrade and don't play business class in the first place. That's why, uh, as you saw in the video, this is an invitation only. Uh, a program. So basically, we will scan the flights uh, that have this need of extra passengers in business class, and we will filter the passengers we want to make this offer to. So it's not going to be for everyone. If your profile is a business profile, I'm afraid you won't be getting this email. We are going to chase uh, the, the economic passengers that would otherwise never fly business. Thanks. All right. I think that's it for the Q&As. Uh, are we going to uh, give a round of applause? Thank you. <laughs> Okay, next up, we have Jenna from Chop Chop. They're a company from UK, and uh, they're re revolutionary, revolutionizing the way we cook. Hi, everyone. 
We're TopTop, and we are here to make recipes smart. So TopTop is an app that provides dynamic step-by-step -step guidance okay. to creating an entire meal. So this is the game plan I made for Christmas last year. It took me an hour to figure out how to cook all the dishes together. Exactly. And when it came to cooking, um, I had to flip back and forth different recipes and set manual timers, and I ended up burning something in the oven. The problem is that recipes are static and specific to one dish. But things change all the time, and you're always doing multiple things in the kitchen. So the solution is Chop Chop, your personal cooking AI. We're transforming traditional re uh, list-based recipes into dynamic, flexible, and personalized guidance that you can follow at your own pace. So you start by choosing a starter, main, and dessert for your dinner. Uh, Chop Chop's algorithm will figure out how the best sequence for cooking all the dishes on your menu, not just one recipe. And each step has a photo and voice guidance. So listen up, do your step, and say done. Our app will then recognize your voice and we'll move on to the next step. And similar to GPS navigation in your car, Chop Chop will track you as you cook your way through the meal, provide turn-by-turn -turn guidance, and if you mess up, then we'll reroute you. So our secret sauce is our algorithm. In essence, we're translating an experienced chef's brain into an app that can manage multiple processes and also is quick to adjust to all the changes in the kitchen. So to create such flexibility, we're employing ideas from particle physics and biological optimization. We'll be making money in two ways. First, we're collaborating with awesome chefs to create new menus regularly, so you can subscribe monthly or purchase selective content. We're also working with retailers to deliver groceries to your door under the affiliate revenue share programs. So with our dynamic algorithm, we're first innovating the cooking assistance market of $1.7 billion. This includes cooking apps, books, blogs, and lessons. And we're in the process of developing a recipe parser that can take any recipes you find online and mix and match to create your custom game plan. And our ultimate vision is to be the platform for Connected Kitchen, uh, about $10 billion. And we want to integrate all the smart cooking gadgets that are coming to your house. So imagine, Chop Chop will monitor you as you cook, and then uh, ping each device based on when you need them. So then the oven will preheat itself for your roast, and then the Bluetooth temperature probe will tell you exactly when the roast is ready. So we are a team of passionate foodies and techies. Uh, Max is our brilliant quantum theorist, uh, designing our algorithm from scratch. Sergio and George are talented developers, having worked with Nokia, Adidas, and the London Olympics. Pratap is our Michelin-trained chef. Johnson is our financial advisor, and I used to work at McKinsey, mostly focusing on tech strategy, go-to-market, and big data. So thanks for listening. Uh, we're raising our pre-seed round, so please come chat with us later. And don't forget to sign up for a beta at mytoptop.com. It's coming in two weeks' time. Thank you. All right. So judges, who wants to take a first grab? Vincent. I think the recipe uh, business is super crowded. I mean, the sites with uh, recipes are like I mean, thousands and millions of them. So what makes you really unique compared to, uh, to the thousands of already existing sites? Cool. So when we think about competition, there are two different types. There is a recipe discovery guys that really help you find recipes, but they don't really help you with the cooking process itself. On the other hand, there are some step-by-step -step cooking apps, but these are pre-programmed instructions for one recipe at a time. So these are really static still. But what we're doing that's different is that we can help you uh, cook through the entire meal, so multiple courses involved in the meal, uh, and also provide dynamic guidance. So then if you're delayed or if you mess up, then we can course correct you so, so you can still serve things at the right time. Okay. It looks like, was that a follow-up question? No? OK. Gabby? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> this reminded me I had a question. Thanks. Um, maybe uh, you, could, you could share a little bit more about um, the go-to-market uh, strategy and partnering with brands. Is that anything in your, in your strategy? Absolutely. Um, so we'll be reaching out to our users in three different ways. First is at events. So we'll be hustling to talk to all the, uh, all the customers at different food festivals, trade shows. Uh, we'll even cook with Chop Chop to host showcase dinner parties and invite bloggers, early adopters, and other influencers in the space. 
Uh, we're also looking to partner with different consumer bands, uh, celebrity chefs, uh, bloggers, as well as retailers so that we can really establish our brand awareness and reach out to a broader base of users. And thirdly, we have some in-app functionalities that can help encourage users to share their experience. So you can send beautiful invitations to your guests and our, our, manage their RSVPs. And also, uh, you can take a picture of the finished dish and then share it online on Facebook, Twitter, uh, as well as Pinterest. So these are the ways that we'll be reaching out to our users. Cool. All okay. right. Wait. Is that a follow-up? You guys, you guys got to trick me. Stop tricking me like that. <laughs> OK, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, let's give a, a well, well, well round of applause for Chop Thank Chop. you. All right, next up, we have Jonathan from The Newbie. Um, they're actually a spin out project from MIT Media Lab, and they're headquartered in Barcelona. So, very exciting what they're doing around payments, and I'll have you take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon. 50 years ago, a group of banks got together to build a payment network. What we all have today is one of these obsolete technology that we all have in our pockets and that we all use today. The problem is, although the obsolete technology is available, it's dominated by a very limited number of players that charge hefty fees to merchants and also to cardholders. That means all of us consumers. So we've built a solution from the ground up, a digital payment network for the digital era. No more plastic, no more paper receipts, and it's all synchronized in the existing payment flow within the retail merchant solution. So what we have here is an app that gets linked to your bank account. We operate in the SEPA area, so 34 countries in Europe, with a single money license. In the existing terminal, the pin pad, where you typically put your contactless card or you inserted your old credit card, that obsolete technology that you still have in your pocket, we use that same device, but now you can just tap your NFC phone over that device and simply enter your PIN into your mobile phone number. And your receipt will be de delivered digitally inside the application. We integrate into the existing payment flow of the gateway that the merchant already has. And we are the only payment network that is integrated into the point of sale, which means that we have all of the consumer's information. So we have a team from MIT and from Stanford that have D developed world-class algorithms that allow users to keep control of their data throughout the whole time that it is stored. What we are offering to enterprise customers is they no longer need to pay credit card fees. This is a model from last century, and digital is all about people. And it has to be open, and people need to control and own their own data. So we provide an app that is controlled by the user, linked to the bank account, as I mentioned. We sync it up to the point of sale. The user waves his or her app over the, with his NFC phone over the device, and the money is available in real time in the merchant's account. Because there are no intermediaries, because Visa and MasterCard are unable to communicate with all of us, that relationship belongs to banks we are able to, to curate the experience between users and merchants directly. So we act as a social network for them to launch customized offers to those users. New impulse with Apple Pay. Everybody's heard about it. Apple is great. But they're using the Visa MasterCard existing rails, which need to be rebuilt. Think about putting a high-speed locomotive onto 1950s railroad tracks. That's kind of what's happening today. So we're the first merchant-focused network in Europe. Uh, we're the first payment network with full privacy control. And we operate today in 34 countries around Europe. Looking at some of the competition, we've built out a range of features. Some of you will be familiar with some of the companies. But I think what's most interesting here uh, to the audience today is to distinguish our business model. We never charge commission. So a typical merchant will save 30 or 40% of the card fees that they are currently paying. 
We charge flat fees per transaction. And we've built a team uh, with experienced people, five startups between us in the management team previously, uh, people ex-PayPal, uh, an international team uh, with strong advisors uh, to take, take us forward in, into this big opportunity. So next time you walk over one of your devices, instead of taking out a piece of plastic that was invented 50 years ago, yes, take out your mobile phone, because what we've done is reconfigure an established system, linking components in a new way. And we've created a digital payment network to disrupt the payments duopoly that controls 80% of the world's transactions. And that is a mobile disruption. Thank you very much. So two questions, actually. One is, there have been a few attempts in the past to kind of disrupt the credit card industry uh, with Duala and, uh, and a few others. And it seems like you know, even Apple or PayPal seem to eventually kind of confirm with what's going on today. Why is it going to be different this time? And then the second question later on is in terms of chargebacks and things like that, how does it work? Is it more like cash or more like credit card? Okay, what Danube has done, what Danube has done is to digitize cash. So in the digital economy, we realize that cash needs to be reduced for a whole range of reasons. It's expensive to handle, it's difficult, there are leakage problems. And so we've digitized the euro. Uh, Apple Pay is great because it's made by Apple and Apple makes great stuff but they're using a technology that does not belong to them. In the world, there are three types of companies. There are the rule makers, the rule breakers, and the rule takers. And ironically, Apple is taking rules from somebody else's playbook. We think that's not gonna work. So what we've done is build a system that is built for merchants, built for consumers, and we join the merchants and the consumers together using European bank accounts, uh, where we create a wallet for the merchant, a wallet for the user, and we sync those wallets in real time. So in fact, there are no chargebacks because it goes directly against your bank as a direct debit would. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right, Tepo, you look like you're ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're making a lot of assumptions on what Apple does based on Apple Pay 1.0, but, but I'll ask you the question I told you beforehand that I will ask. Thank you. So, so because there, there, there really, is no customer benefit here, uh, consumer benefit to be precise. The benefit is on, on the merchant side because of lower fees, but the experience is the same uh, for, for the consumer or actually a little bit worse because you don't get your bonuses anymore because your company cannot afford to pay them as you have lower fees. So how are you going to get the consumers on board? How are you gonna solve that chicken and egg? Yeah, I love the, t the question. Thanks, Tipo. So merchants are very keen in creating an alternative system, as, as we mentioned. Because merchants are keen, they are going to be paying for the rewards to their consumers. So our first uh, customer, which is a tier two supermarket chain, it's about a billion dollar operation. Uh, they have 600,000 people in their loyalty program, their loyalty scheme, and they will be communicating with those people in the loyalty scheme directly uh, incentivizing them to download this app and use it at their stores. And we're working on our marketing plan uh, together to promote that jointly. Our second uh, supermarket, uh, sorry, after the supermarket, we have a fashion chain here in Spain uh, that is deploying us uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, now in the month of March. And likewise, they have a VIP set of customers uh, with whom they would like to communicate via mobile and with whom they're willing to give direct rewards to. So the rewards may not come from where they used to come from, but they are certainly there for the user. And we never sell your data. For the generation M, that's a big deal. So we have time for one more question. Uh, I, yeah, my questions were quite similar to the ones that my colleague made. Uh, but there is a classical chicken and egg uh, question here, is um, how are you gaining uh, traction um, you know, engaging all these merchants and all these users at the same time before, you know, your proposal, your value proposition is, is fine for, you know, the community. And uh, another, another time is, um, I know that technologically um, is going to be very different from Apple Pay or even uh, Google Wallet or, or 
it's little about the experience for consumers and for uh, for merchants is going to be uh, quite similar. I mean, you know, um, I don't see like the difference between, you know, the big difference between the experience, the user experience, in Apple uh, between Apple Pay or any other um, payment system, mobile payment system, or, or this one. No? So that's Okay, so to answer, I think, what was the first part of your question, the chicken and egg situation. As I mentioned, uh, because merchants want to deploy this service, they are willing to promote it to their existing customers. Merchants, as you know, have very powerful loyalty programs and loyalty schemes of their own. So they're going to be communicating to their existing customers about our solution. So that gives us their brand credibility vis-a-vis -vis their customers. And in the case of our first customer here in, in Barcelona, uh, with a supermarket chain, they have some 600,000 consumers that will be messaged about our service. And it won't be a one-off. It's going to be a continued program throughout the year. And they will also receive incentives. Regarding your second question, I don't agree with you. I dis uh, respectfully disagree with the statement that there is no difference right now. We hear about omni-channel in the retail environment and also in airlines. And what is happening is that many organizations do not actually have a mobile channel to communicate effectively with users. Yes, there are social media, but those, those are for social things. But if you need specific things for payments and loyalty, that channel doesn't exist yet. Well, it didn't until now. And so the experience there is that we can customize your offers, personalize them, make sure that the consumer feels comfortable because he or she is always in control of their data. And then we can push those offers directly from the merchants to those consumers in real time. And okay, we also gonna, have... We're going to stop there a little bit. Okay. But hey, I know the new is live in Barcelona. If the people yes. in the audience would like to try it out, what would, they, would it work for them? Sure. Please uh, visit dinubi.com, D-I-N-U-B-E.com. And uh, you will receive an email probably in the next 15 days. We'll be going live at a fashion chain here in Barcelona. And so you'll be one of the first to enjoy this uh, digital payment network, which we're very proud to produce and announce here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dinu. All right, next up, we have Edamon. Um, they're a US company, and they're building the world's food network database. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming today. We are Edamon, the world's central food database. Our mission is to organize world's food knowledge and to become the most trusted source for food and, diet and food and nutrition information. To that end, we've developed our solutions, a real-time nutrition analysis with natural language processing, which can provide in a second nutri full nutritional analysis of any recipe text or ingredient list, a database of one and a half million recipes from around the, w the web, all organized uh, and nutritionally tagged with diet, health, and allergen tags. And finally, our recipe search, which under a second can provide you with thousands of results for any search you make, be it for uh, specific food, recipe, with um, all filtered with your, your diet and uh, food uh, requirements. So what are the, the issues we solve for our clients? For Gannett, the, publisher, the US publisher of uh, USA Today, We've uh, provided a, um, a solution which, which resolved their issue with diet-focused recipe search for a baby boomers media. For Nestle, we provide a recipe database with high-quality recipes, all nutritionally and, uh, nutritionally and diet tagged for a solution where they were building for um, their consumers to, for meal planning. And finally, for Epicurious, we provide simply nutritional data for about 300,000 recipes, but we did this in a week time. So for, uh, we also have a full set of consumer applications on all platforms. Most recently, we partnered with Samsung as health ecosystem, where they needed a tool for users to analyze and log uh, in particular recipes, all this with high level of accuracy. We provided them with a food logging application, which is available today in the Galaxy S-Health partner store. 
and which, which uh, provides immediate information about food and that choices they might have from our one and a, million uh, one and a half million database. So what's our attraction so far? We've uh, had six, uh, since 2013 when we launched, we have uh, six large marquee clients to date. Uh, we most recently uh, signed last year with, uh, we launched with Samsung in our partnership and we have already have a robust pipeline of deals for uh, potential deals for 2015. We signed with New York Times about two weeks ago, so uh, we're starting there. Also, we recently launched our API uh, for a public API to, um, to, uh, uh, to uh, developers, and already we have 500 uh, subscribers to the API, and we are uh, running at 100 new subscribers among, uh, among developers. And what's the future, the way we see it? We see a future where a consumer using a mobile device or any interface will, be, uh, will, will, be, will have access in real time to nutrition and food data, would it be in the store, in the restaurant, or on the street. All this data powered by Edamam's nutrition and food engine. Thank you. Vincent? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't really get what's your business model. Uh, we, r we run a licensing model with our, uh, generally it's a B2B uh, business, so our business model is on licensing. We license the, the food data, the nutrition data on the recipe database. Uh, cases are different, sometimes it's per hit, sometimes it's uh, full licensing of the database, sometimes it's just uh, per recipe, it's, it's all so different. So it means that for Nestle, you're, I mean, you're licensing the recipes to For Nestle, Nestle in particular, we license the entire database the, so that they can build their application on top of it. Uh, for uh, Epicurious, it was simply uh, based on, uh, on the recipes they needed to analyze. So it's based on usage in general, one or another. Any other questions from judges? Okay. Wait, no, we got, we got one from Francis. Sorry. Uh, just, um, I don't know if you are familiar with an um, uh, initiative uh, by Ferran Adrià, the chef, the Spanish chef, yep. called uh, Bullipedia. It's kind of a Wikipedia for, um, for food and cooking. Uh, do you think that could be a competitor in this? No, actually, we are talking with uh, Telefonica, who are uh, running this initiative. With uh, we are talking with the exact team who runs the Bully Pain initiative in Telefonica, and they see us as a potential partner with uh, with the semantic technology we've developed. It's only a support uh, to what they do. Uh, we are also, uh, I just forgot to mention, we are doing uh, what we did in English. We are doing right now in Spanish, so we expect to launch by the end of the year in Spanish as well. So it's also complementary to what they do. But thank you for the question. <laughs> Right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we have Fene. Fene is coming from a long way from Finland, and uh, they are building a the next generation adventure gifting service. Hello. My name is Riikka Lindström. I am here presenting company called Fene. Um, and uh, we are concentrating on the problem that corner shops are struggling because online shopping is uh, growing very fast. We also want to help consumers to buy better gifts and more easy and fast way. This is a huge market. It's uh, 200 billion um, US dollars and it has annual growth. So our solution is that we have online shop with curated gifts. Uh, we have a shopkeeper, shopkeeper tool for our partners to follow up the sales and brief wrap the gifts. And also we have this unique solution, Finne Wayfinder, which is, which is the first adventurous gift app in the world. And you can collect your gift from the shop with joy. So how it works? You buy a gift from our online store. There is an SMS going to the receiver of the gift and she downloads the app. And then she puts in, uh, the gift code in, and then our app will lead her way to the center of the city, and she will follow the, our graphical compass to the shop, and the gift is waiting for her beautifully frapped and ready-made. And after that, she can open the gift and share it in Facebook, for example. We have an easily scalable business model. 
We take 25% of each sold gift. This is a low cost model and we can do it from anywhere to everywhere. And we also make uh, tailored uh, campaigns for our partners. We are going to make 1 million revenue this year. Uh, we are going to get 30,000 active users when we launch in London and uh, deliver 10,000 gifts. We will have 250 partners this year. And at the moment, we have 55 uh, luxurious partners, mainly in Helsinki and Frankfurt. Uh, next will come Berlin and London. We also have a uh, uh, market entry plan with design hotels. And at the moment, we have two hotels in Helsinki and two in Berlin. Uh, this is our team. We have a lot of know-how in uh, technology, design, and uh, business. Uh, we have first investor involved and also senior advisor from Nokia. So we are now raising 1 million euros to get uh, global rapid growth, growth and also to, to raise our sales force and IT team. So I come from Lapland. This is my father. We want to help him to, uh, develop, uh, to deliver gifts in a mobile way and take this uh, gift business to next level and 21st century. And we want all of you to join our journey. And you can collect your gift from our booth uh, in the finalist area. Thank you. So very exciting. We have, you know, it's touching luxury, it's touching location, and it's touching commerce. And I think Gabby is jumping on the mic. So, uh, Gabby, would you have some feedback? So, uh, I was wondering, you're talking about scale and how, how easy it is to scale your model. And it seemed like by what you calculators about, you get five new businesses every month, basically. But you got 50 businesses in 10 months. Uh, how, are you, how are you planning to scale and reach uh, the, the large amounts of business you need to get uh, those amounts of partners and uh, businesses working with you? Uh, we are going, uh, going to find some umbrella persons from uh, every location that can help us to find like 200 jobs uh, in every city. And that is the way to get rabbit, rabbit road with and take this to every big city. Thank you. Is there any plan to white label the service? Uh, because I mean, just to create that for a specific retailer that would like, I mean, just to run that program, but only for gift from its own store or its own chain. So that's what I would call right label. Uh, yes, we are going to do these tailored campaigns. Uh, this will be our first in Helsinki. So it's like very easy to make these campaigns with uh, bigger brands and make treasure hunts in, uh, in cities and uh, develop uh, different kind of ways how to use this software. All right. Oh, Katrin. Well, one more question. Other than your father, Santa, um, I have to pick up my gift myself because Santa was bringing me the gift. Um, how do people actually accept that they have to pick up, uh, pick up um, the gift that's provided to them? Um, of course, there is people that don't want to go and pick it up. But then there is uh, this part of people who wants to uh, do something playful, something nice. And because it's gamified, it's fun. So I think it's um, more that you can give experience with the gift. So I think it's a quite positive feeling, uh, feeling in, uh, in this way, if you think it. So it's not only the gift itself, but the experience of the game together. Yes, yes. All right, so Rika, I know you guys are live in a few cities. Where can the audience send gifts or receive gifts today, uh, if they today, want to try it out? Yeah, in Helsinki, uh, we have uh, mostly of our partners in Helsinki at the moment, Frankfurt. Uh, next will be Berlin, 10 shops, two hotels, uh, London, seven shops. Uh, so we are going very fast uh, to all the cities and hopefully we, get, we will get a lot of help with that. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, next up we have Terry, all the way from US, from Hook Mobile. Um, this is sort of an unfair fight because these guys have $6 million in funding, which is the largest funding amount of all the startups. But um, what they're doing is super interesting, so I will let Terry tell you about Hook Mobile. Thank you, Mike. Cheers. Good afternoon. Today I'll tell you a little bit about the uh, virtual number economy and uh, how Hook Mobile is playing the game. Uh, there's, uh, the the, the IP-based apps have uh, uh, changed the world and many of them have to reach uh, the telecom devices. 
So the way they do that is by using virtual telephone numbers. And um, uh, we generally, you know, th these telephone numbers generate calls and, and SMS just like people do. And we call this uh, economy that related to these virtual numbers the virtual number economy. Uh, Google Voice introduced the first uh, virtual telephone number service in 2009. And in the last five years in the U.S., they have got, uh, the virtual number uh, space have gone from zero to uh, over 100 million phone numbers. Many, many apps use uh, virtual numbers for uh, authentication and communications. I'll give you a couple quick examples. Uh, GroupMe uses assign the number to the, uh, uh, to the group. So every, you can form a group on real time. Uh, for, the, you know, for the panel of judges, for example, they send a message. Uh, to the group number, and the message is automatically forwarded to everybody in the group. Uh, you can use a conference call a service where they text you the number, and uh, when you receive the message, you, you dial back and you get bridged into the conference call. Uber, uh, obviously very popular, and some of you may or may not realize, Uber assigns a virtual number to every single car. Uh, so that uh, makes the communications between the rider and the driver completely anonymous and that protects your privacy. Uh, Two-factor authentication, another huge use case, and that's been used over a billion times in the last two years, uh, primarily due to the uh, success of the social apps that have uh, address book integration. Lots of use cases, I won't bore you with them all, but effectively, uh, the market is expected to grow 15 times in the next four years to reach about $7.5 billion. So how does Hook Mobile play in the space? Well, so if the first service, Google Voice, when they come, you know, they introduce a service. By definition, 100% of their traffic go to telecom networks. So over the five years, all these services, you know, hundreds and thousands of IP-based services come in use, using virtual numbers. All of them throw 100% of their traffic into the telecom networks. Well, we look at this and we say, well, that doesn't make any sense because uh, right now about 15% of the traffic both originate and terminate on a virtual number, and they're both IP-based services. So we created what we call a V2V hub to allow these services to exchange the traffic directly. So what that basically means is the status quo is you got a bag of mail and you put a piece of stamp on every piece of mail. And what we allow them to do is come to us first and we will sort the mail put the 15% of mail that don't need a stamp, we'll box it up and private deliver it for them for no cost. Now for the rest of it, they can bring it back and put a stamp on it all they want, or they can leave the box with us and we'll deliver it for them as well. By the way, all of that, done is, is, all of that is done through the, cr uh, the cloud. And you can add your imagination, what, what other services you could do when you deliver the mail uh, in the private delivery versus putting a stamp on it. We have had uh, consistent growth in the last eight, qu eight quarters, 20-25% uh, uh, growth, and uh, we've been profitable for uh, four quarters. Uh, we have the proven team that has done this before. I founded three startups. Uh, one of my companies, actually my first company, was sold uh, for over $400 million, and I'm able to create a team that has the expertise and uh, execution to be able to do this. Uh, our strategy is very simple. We want to dominate using the hub which is not designed to generate a lot, you know, necessarily a lot of revenue, because we want to make, the, uh, uh, make it really easy to use the hub, but then we want to uh, leverage that to help us compete to get additional share in the market, as well as innovate on top of these uh, uh, services so we could create additional services. Uh, that's pretty much what I want to tell you. Our vision is to define and dominate the space in the virtual, uh, new virtual number economy. Thank you. All right, to find and dominate. So, um, question, do you have feedback from the judges? So can you talk a bit about how it compares to services like Twilio and things like that? Absolutely. Um, you may not call it, but uh, Twilio actually generates revenue for us. So if you think about it, uh, all the services that use Twilio today, Twilio is actually one of the larger beneficiary if, if, you know, as part of the hub. Because effectively, you know, they will come and effectively save 15% of the cost right away. 
Um, and we also, you know, work with them very closely. So they're, they're a, both a customer and a partner. Terry, does this work worldwide or only in the U.S. right now? Yeah, um, so actually version one of this is uh, just SMS for the uh, plus one market, which is U.S. and Canada. Um, the next phase will add voice, will add rich media, will be able to add like uh, encryption, uh, and then the next phase will be international. So this, is, this, is, this phenomenon, as you know, with Twilio, uh, it's actually, you know, it's growing worldwide. And in terms of the quality and latency of you know, either SMS or body, especially as you add calls, like how would that compare to what you yeah. get over the regular Perfect. network? Perfect. Uh, so if you think about it, when you throw 100% of your traffic to telecom networks, it actually hops between all these telecom networks to get to the, the end, end point. So this hub effectively allows them to come direct. And, and that's why all these services make sense. It, you get direct if delivery confirmation. You get the least amount of latency. Um, it, it basically removes all the telecom legacy network limitations and bring additional services when they all come together on the same platform. Thanks. Is there one more? Could we have a quick one. Sure, yeah. could, could you just elaborate a little bit about how you make money today? Yeah, terrific. Um, so as you see, we grow with the market just like Twilio does. Everybody is basically trying to deliver the mail. So we, you know, and that, that space is expected to grow 15x in the next four years. So everyone in the space is doing really well. Twitter just, uh, if you read, you know, the Wall Street Journal, uh, they just announced that they, they surpassed $100 million in revenue. So all of us are doing quite well and we're growing very fast. So what we effectively uh, are differentiating ourselves is by leveraging this V2V hub, which is a, a membership business model, and then that will help us to grow all these transactional business model, both in the traditional space where we're all competing, and then creating innovative services when, you know, when the platform is ubiquitous. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have Alex from Kickdish from Switzerland, and he basically built a startup that, com that com combines a few of the other type business areas that, that, that we've seen today. So, That's correct. Uh, Alex, I'll have you got the slides. Yep, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, so my name is Alex. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm from Kickdish. I'm founder and seed investor in Kickdish. And we're actually the first meal and grocery planner out there that price compares uh, online grocers. So um, I will show you in a second the product demo. There are many, many companies in this space that do a part, whether it's comparing prices or whether it's meal planning. Uh, but nobody is universal in the sense that they cover the whole workflow, starting with meal preferences and ending in an ordered list. So let's see. Uh, I think somebody needs to, to press the play button. Can somebody go back and pr press the play button? It's uh, at the bottom. It worked in Keynote. Why not now? So meanwhile, um, at the bottom, there should be a play button. What good is an app if you can't demo it? So while we get that started, I personally believe that in 10 years from now, 90% of all people will do groceries this way. I will quickly tell you what this demo shows you, and I'm happy to show it to any one of you after this presentation. It asks for your food preference, first of all. Then you get to select a personal recipe box. It's working, great. So you can fine tune your preferences because what you saw was raw. Let's say that you can't have peanut. So you select all the ingredients that contain peanut, you save your preferences, and then you go and select your personal recipe box, which you only have to do once, of course. Uh, so you select favorite recipes. All your recipes that you're seeing right here don't contain any gluten, lactose, or, uh, or peanut. You would favorite a couple of those recipes, so you essentially bookmark them, which makes it really easy for you to find them in the menu planner. This is the menu planner, and I will just select a couple of recipes. You can do that for today, but you can also go to the next days, up to seven days if you want. Uh, you decide with how many people you're gonna eat it, and then you create the grocery list. So this, is, uh, for, uh, this would have been for yesterday. Uh, the grocery list uh, talks to the server and creates the grocery list per category or a full list. 
whatever you prefer. You can add staples, so the, the usual stuff that you buy anyway, uh, or you can add an item, any item you want, and then you choose compare basket. This is the interesting part. Uh, we're launching in the US in a, in a week from now with these five companies, Amazon, Fresh to Peapod. It's sorted by price. In this case, I go for Safeway. I order, I select my delivery address. The next step is I select a time slot for delivery either today or tomorrow or whatever the partner does, and you finish up. So that's the whole workflow starting from meal preferences until uh, delivery. Great, that worked. So, as I said, my vision is that everybody or 90% of the people will do this. It's a big consumption, but we're testing it. Um, and nobody owns this market yet, so it's definitely uh, something new. Um, needless to say, the online grocery market is, is growing at an exponential, exponential rate, so it's a very interesting market. The problem is that um, price will be king again. Because you used to do groceries uh, in, at a supermarket that was just around the corner. That was uh, location, 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 but that's dead. So as comparisons will be very easy, price will be, ki uh, will be king again. I know I have to flip. So location is dead. Why is this disruptive? Because of the fact that location is dead. But also mobile enables some unique things, like for example collaboration. We've got that in the app right now, today. Push notifications when your wife updates your shopping list, for example. Uh, but also, you can do your grocery shopping literally when you're on the metro. I don't see anybody opening up their laptop in the metro to do their grocery shopping, but with mobile you can. So that's why it's disruptive by mobile. Channel push won't work. That's what a lot of companies do right now. They don't think from the consumer to begin with. Business model is kickbacks. Tesco in the UK is giving 10%, which is not sustainable in my point of view long term, but it shows you that supermarkets are willing to give a kickback. I invite you to do the math that this is really what I believe a unicorn uh, opportunity. Uh, average online basket is $80 per week. We tend to get 1 million users and I believe the, the referral fee will settle down between 1 to 5% uh, and you can do the math and see how many uh, revenue that is. That's basically it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Let's do uh, this is a quick question from the judges. Maybe can we do grocery shopping from the air? Is this something that you're working on? Uh, just, just kidding. It's, from uh, where? Sorry. <laughs> from, from the air, from the airplane. Ah. No, but uh, for the judges, do you have any feedback for uh, for Alex? Alex. So uh, another company we talked about earlier, uh, my supermarket that operates in England. They try to penetrate the U.S. only to realize that it's much more geography based there. Exactly. So Peapod serves certain areas and then uh, you know, some of the others, Amazon Fresh, Fresh Direct. So how are you gonna do pricing comparison if you only have one service provider in each area? That's a very good point. There are a couple of providers that are country uh, wide. Safeway is, uh, is one of them. And all the, the, the companies we included here are rapidly expanding their geographical coverage. So for us, this is really about testing uh, the market and uh, by the time that we're fully up and running uh, you know they're adding geographical locations every uh, every month so we're using that uh, that traction thanks do you see the the supermarkets the developing uh, solutions like this by themselves as well is that a competition that you're, you're you're worried about well like i said there's a channel push going on that the sense that okay we have a traditional business all we need uh, online shopping and mobile version as well. No supermarket is offering you to uh, buy groceries at one of their competitors yet. But I think that's an interesting exit strategy long term because how great would it be as a Walmart that you make money on your customers shopping somewhere else? Thank okay, thank you. We, we're gonna, I, I know the party is getting started. We have 10 more minutes left. We have one more company, great company for the city. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Liz on Similarity. And she's going to talk to us today about predictive analytics. Hi, I'm Liz Durr. I'm founder and CEO of Simularity. We do predictive analytics for the connected world. So the connected world is full of massive amounts of real-time data that, frankly, most of you don't know what to do with yet. 
Similarity is the only machine learning company that turns massive amounts of real-time data into insights at your fingertips in seconds. Predictive analytics and machine learning have a lot of potential, but they won't become truly valuable and ubiquitous until they can handle massive amounts of real-time data that they can learn on the fly, that they can run on commodity hardware and produce explainable predictive models that decision makers can actually use. Our software is purpose-built to do exactly that. So if you've got data scientists, this is what they're producing. Good luck explaining this to your organization so that they know what action to take. Our predictive models are easy to create, explain, and use. If you're not machine learning at the edge of the network, you're going to be left behind. The amount of data is growing faster than the network capacity as billions of connected devices are being added every year. You can't just run fiber to your car or your satellite to collect the billions of readings and images that are generated every day from the hundreds of sensors on these machines. You need smarts at the edges to exploit that data. So here's some uh, example implementations. We've got major customers in quite a wide variety of industries, telecommunications, healthcare, machine data, predictive maintenance, retail, and building automation, just to name a few. Here we go. Uh, here's a quick look at a network monitoring app that we built for Orange Silicon Valley. We started with 130 billion data points, uh, and we have integrated it with Tableau so that they can use it uh, as part of their normal dashboard monitoring. Here we have a proof of concept that we developed for a medical group in California that enables doctors to get context sensitive alerts about patient risks. Here's, here's a monitoring system that we built for Hitachi Data Systems that does real time predictive maintenance on hard drives. Uh, based on 53 sensors on each drive and using our proprietary uh, event predictive archetypes. So business summary, we sell software. We sell to enterprises and technology companies and our software can be installed on premise or sold as a service. We're We've got a growing list of partners. We've got technology partners, service provider partners, which are going to help us scale, and resellers. We were incorporated in 2011. We got a lot of recognition in the startup community. Uh, our revenue grew 11x from 2013 to 2014, and we are Hitachi Data Systems Technology Alliance partners. So, our software is transforming industries, making businesses more effective, uh, profitable, powering research that wasn't possible before, improving outcomes. Come ask me how I can make it happen for you. All right. So quick, let's do a quick question from judges, and then we're going to go into voting. So guys, think about everything that you've seen. We're going to put a link on the screen. You have a few minutes to vote and uh, we'll do the prizing and then we can get the party started. So judges, this is uh, the last round of questioning. Do you have uh, some feedback for Liz? Thank you. Uh, do you have any experience uh, working with banks or financial services? We do. We're actually working with a major online payment processor uh, in their fraud and risk modeling group. So what sets you apart from your competition in, in analytics? I'm sorry, could you repeat? What, what sets you apart from your competition? What, what's specific about your product? Perfect. So we actually handle massive amounts of data, billions, trillions of data points. And we can actually handle that in real time, ingesting more than a million data points a second. All that can be used in 
uh, real analysis and predictive models at your fingertips. We make it easy for other people, regular people, not data scientists, to understand the predictive models, and we make it easy to deploy the models. Okay, so you would say also user experience is one competitive advantage from the Yes. Campus. All right, thank you very much, Liz. Thank you. Great, okay, so um, on, on the screen, there's a link uh, that you can go. Basically, you type, there's two sessions, you select one, you can start basically, it's super simple. You pick your favorite startup, right? Whatever that might mean to you. We'll have an audience choice, so we'll just see you know, what the audience think. And then the judges, will, I'm gonna come over there, let's start tallying it up. And in the meanwhile, can we have John Lorenzo from Google? Um, they're gonna present a prize today as well, and he'll tell you about what's happening with that. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm probably the last person that's going to be preventing you for partying today, so uh, I will try to be brief. Uh, Google is uh, representing here a um, startup spirit, I would say. We are still a startup. I, I work for Google Cloud. It's only about 200 people of us uh, all over the world. So we are not such a big company. We are pretty much an entrepreneurial company that's uh, trying to make its best out of uh, this cloud uh, approach uh, to the new paradigm of, uh, of cloud computing. Um, we do like startups. I mean, we try to be as close as we can. Even though we are very few people, we try to be very close to startups because we believe that this is probably what's going to be sustaining the economy within the next 20, 50 years. That this is the way it's going to be. We are not going to be seeing so many companies uh, like the companies that we used to know were the companies where our parents used to work. So having said that, uh, I would like to let you know that uh, Google's giving away $100,000 to the startup that these guys will be uh, choosing today uh, that's going to be used in, uh, in just basically grow into the cloud and, and try to make your business successful. So we want to contribute to that success. Um, that's pretty much what I wanted to tell you. Um, and um, I wish uh, that all these startups that are represented here today are going to be uh, lucky enough as to uh, be uh, a long uh, story in the, uh, in the cloud business and in the new economy business. So uh, thanks very much, guys. Uh, good luck to all of you. And uh, I'm really uh, eager to know who is going to be the uh, uh, winner of the prize. So I don't know if the judges have already voted or uh, how is it? going Whoa. it's a little bit of tension there you can feel it <laughs> I feel like in the Oscar ceremony like two weeks ago and the winner is yeah we're not digital yet here Huh? <laughs> We're not digital yet in the calculation. <laughs> we are in four years from now. How can we be using pens exactly. and pencils? I That's mean, the, this, this makes no sense. <clears throat> He's almost there. Okay, we have a solution. Thank you, Judge. That's what you guys are. <laughs> <laughs> what a flaw judging model. Are we all good now? Okay, so um, are you guys done? Audience voting? Are you guys done with, with voting? Yeah? Good? We're all good? Okay, can we get um, all the startups to come on stage? And Sean from F Success, are you back? Okay, and Bridget, you guys come over here. This is for the for the money shot. We're gonna all be in a in a great selfie together. All right. So, what do the honors? So somebody needs to. So I, it's a it's a award ceremony. So I have to say something, and then somebody has to say the winner because I can't do both at the same time. So, you wanna do it, Katrin? 
<laughs> okay, Katrin. So, all right. So the winner for today's uh, four years from now startup award is. You need to open. It's to, yeah, she needs to open. Yeah. So the winner is. Caravello. All right. <laughs> Okay, so we will, so we will announce the audience winner uh, in a little bit. Well, all of you guys that have signed up, you're gonna get a, a, an email push notification. We still need to tally up that vote, but in the meanwhile, take some pictures. Um, they're gonna be outside uh, in the networking area, so feel free to say hi, and uh, let's uh, let's get started with the happy hour. And thank you very much for coming. We'll be here tomorrow. Okay. <laughs>